Well, hello, my name is Brian Blackmore for Dave.video, where we interview passionate end users about the products that they're most passionate about. So with me today is Paul Andrews. He's an engineer um, and global development manager for DPA microphones. And we're gonna be talking today about the DPA 2028 handheld microphone. And also with me today is Lauren Aldrin. Uh, Lauren is a, he's a webmaster by day but he's also um, a worship leader, a musician. He's been a studio owner in the past. He's written for Mix Magazine, EQ, as well as many others. He's the author of the Home Studio Guide to Microphones, which was published by Mix Books back in the day. And Lauren uh, recently, inter uh, recently reviewed the DPA 28 for Church Production Magazine. So welcome to you both. Uh, we first caught wind of the, uh, the new 2028 uh, in late summer of 2019. We were very excited to get our hands on it and uh, were able to do this review and publish it earlier this year. So, um, so Paul Andrews, uh, first tell us about the, what the 2028 is and what the intent was in designing this new handheld. Absolutely. Brian and Lauren, first of all, thank you for having me on. Really appreciate it. So the 2028 handheld microphone, the reason we, we designed this is really as a little brother to another handheld microphone that we've designed, which is called the DeFacto, or a lot of people like to refer to that as the 4018V or VL. The 2028 being the little brother uh, is that in many ways, it's a smaller form factor. It has a better price point. Um, coming in a street price at about $6.99. And what we really tried to do is reach a market that may not necessarily be able to step into the de facto being our flagship microphone. We wanted to offer something that is just as comparable and just as uh, performance ready on stage or in any application actually that you're looking for, but something that's going to be a lot easier on the wallet. Okay, thanks, Paul. So, Lauren, um, so you've written dozens of microphone reviews. In fact, you wrote the book earlier that I mentioned earlier, The Home Studio Guide to Microphones. What is it that you are looking for when you start an evaluation of a microphone? I like to consider what its application is and whether it's a direct hit for that. Uh, depending on the application, you may want a mic that has a colored response. Uh, you may need a mic that is very flat, um, often, or accurate or honest would be the words we would use there. Often a handheld microphone by nature of the fact that it's going to be used primarily for vocals, it's going to be used close which means the directional pattern causes a buildup of bass called proximity effect. Often there is a corresponding increase in um, presence, upper treble, um, and that is to add clarity to the vocal and make that very um, articulate sound that we're used to. So as I'm listening to a microphone, how, how is it accomplishing what it's set out to do? The 2028 was interesting um, in that it is a handheld vocal mic, but it is very honest the the treble upper mid-range response present response is is a little bit boosted but not a lot so when i get a microphone like that that tells me that the manufacturer is shooting for a broader application than just a handheld vocal and indeed i had a chance to test it on a number of instruments and found the 2028 to excel at recording uh, most all of those in addition to being a, a really top quality handheld vocal microphone. Now a handheld vocal mic that doesn't have a very tailored response requires a little bit more of the performer in terms of how they will manage the distance between their microphone and their mouth. And it really requires um, sound engineering and mixing to be a, a step above in a way because you may not get the perfect sound directly out of the microphone without a little bit of enhancement and equalization, but that's what a good you know, sound engineer will give you. Right. Paul, is that what uh, is that what DPA had in mind? A, a, an honest uh, flat microphone that didn't require a lot of work on the side of the on the part of the sound engineer. Absolutely. So everything that DPA does is all about, like like you had mentioned, the honesty or the accuracy aspect of the microphone. We want to produce a microphone that is going to represent the source 
as accurately as we possibly can. So when you think about a microphone that's been pre-EQ'd or something that is designed for a specific purpose, in a way, yes, it can provide an instant gratification for a lot of folks, but at the same time, it also has a tendency to box someone in, saying, well, the EQ of this microphone is the way it's going to sound. So now, let's say in a scenario where the, the 2K happens to be boosted in any particular microphone and the room that you happen to be in is also exhibiting higher boost capabilities within that range, right? So now you may have too much. So now you're fighting against the natural or the design characteristics of the mic. So thinking about the, the linear aspect or the accuracy of a microphone, in the end, it's going to leave the engineer open to the capability of shaping that sound or tailoring it to the source exactly as they want. So Paul, why don't you take that a bit further and, and uh, walk us through some of the components uh, of the microphone itself? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm gonna switch over and we're gonna take a look at the microphone a little bit more closely here. What we've got here is a microphone that basically allows you to expose the capsule. And what I'm doing is I'm taking off the inner screen pop filter right here. You can see on the inside that there is an acoustically accurate foam pop filter as well as the outer grill. So that's a three part filtration system that's going on right there. This capsule that's sitting here is housed, it's fixed to the body but yet it's completely floating. So you can see I can move this back and forth right here. This is housed in a piece of fluoride membrane, which allows it to float, which really helps with handling noise and things like that. If you happen to be uh, clapping or, or doing something that may cause the, the microphone to, to transmit handling noise, it really helps mitigate that. So within this setup right here, one of the really neat things, I'm going to, I'm going to put this back together, is this microphone has a 60 degree operational window. And what I mean by that is when I hold the microphone up like this or like this, you can see that I'm on axis to the microphone, right? This mic has a 4.7 inch linear operating distance. And what I mean by that is we tested the microphone to be four and a half inches away. And this is where the microphone is going to produce its most linear frequency response. So Lauren, as you mentioned earlier, we were talking about the proximity effect, or you had mentioned that. So the closer you bring this in, in this regard, yes, you are going to start to exhibit a little bit more of that proximity, but it is designed to sit right in here, which gives maximum flexibility for the artist. So when they learn that microphone technique, they can be back and forth. Now, that 60 degree window that I was talking about earlier, whether you're on axis like this or off axis, there is this very forgiving window that this window or this mic operates in. So even if I'm off axis like this, if I'm on stage and I'm not paying super close attention to where the mic is, the front of house or the engineer isn't gonna feel the need to continually monitor or boost my high end even if I'm off axis like this. Now, once I step outside of this 60 degree window, this is where the null point happens. This is a super cardioid microphone by design. So anything off of this backside or outside of that 60 degree window, that's where the rejection really takes place. And that's what you want in a good microphone that's especially gonna be in and around secondary sound sources in a live environment, as an example. And I'll add one thing that I noticed, and this is something else that I test for, is there's off-axis rejection in terms of the overall uh, decrease in level, but there's also inevitable coloration, which means that, that the sound is both reduced and filtered, essentially. And with the 2028, I noticed, um, less off-axis coloration than I expect, which is great. Um, even out to 90 degrees, the sound was simply turned down. It wasn't mangled. 
um, as many microphones will, will give you sound as you come off the pattern. And what that does is if you have bleed, which is almost inevitable on stage, the coloration is not going to affect that sound. It comes into the side of the mic, it's being picked up, yes, but it matches very closely the sound that was you know, perhaps being picked up by the direct mic in another part of the stage. So that's a real plus. And I think the 2028 did a really good job with that. Great point, so, Lauren. That's exactly right. Yeah. Um, either one of you could take this next one. So Lauren mentioned um, in the article that he used the microphone in several uh, several applications uh, on instruments and, and the like. So how does this, um, I don't know, this, uh, this, this window and the quality of the off-axis sound, how does that play into uh, the flexibility of the mic if, for example, you're going to use it on an instrument? Lauren, you want to jump into that and I'll, I'll follow up? Sure, yeah. Well, in, anytime you have a, a forgiving pattern, it just makes your job a little bit easier. In a studio setting, you're usually very controlled with your mic placement. Uh, with a live setting on an instrument, say on an acoustic guitar where someone's moving around as they play, or a mandolin or something like that, then having that, that kind of forgiving pattern is, is a real plus. And uh, I wanted to share a little story after I wrote the review and before I returned the mic, sadly, um, I had the opportunity to use the 2028 in a way that you would never expect to use a handheld vocal mic because it is really more than that. Uh, I was actually recording a, a classical symphony. So I had uh, mics all over the place. And one of the pieces was a harp and solo violin. The, the first violin a concert master came over to play this piece. And I put the 2028 on a stand above the um, violin pointing down and ended up getting uh, really a fantastic sound in that application. You wouldn't normally dream of doing that with a vocal mic. And one of the main reasons is they tend to have that presence boost in the two to four or even higher 8K range. And on a violin especially, that makes for a very shrieky sound. It's not flattering at all. I knew the DPA had a little bit of that, but I wanted to give it a try. And at a decent miking distance, probably, uh, 18 inches or so off the instrument. I got a very nice sound, very articulate, but it wasn't shrieky. It was very honest and accurate. And again, that points back to the DPA, you know, pedigree as a studio and classical microphone. It, it did a fantastic job. That's really neat, Lauren. Great story. Yeah. I've, I've, use these microphones in, in many different applications. Um, it sounds like you're starting to experiment with that as well. The neat thing about the characteristics of the mic, as you mentioned, the on and off axis linearity, being able to capture the source as well as secondary sound sources accurately so that that off axis is, only, is just attenuated, but it's not exhibiting any sort of comb filtering or phasing issues potentially within that. So thinking about that linear operating distance that I mentioned earlier, that four and a half inches, 4.7 inches to be exact. The neat thing about that is in your scenario, you were recording violin about 18 inches away. So you were actually using the proximity effect in its negative sense, you know, cutting the bass to an extent, which the violin doesn't produce anyways, right? right? So y it was a great scenario that you happened to place that in. I absolutely love this microphone, you know, in close proximity, I'll put it right on top of a snare. I'll do things like that. Or I've used it in scenarios where I'll get it on stage very, very close to an upright bass. And it just it grabs all of that low end beautiful you know tone that the instrument has but because i can get it this close to the soundboard i'm not introducing the proximity in the positive sense right it's just accurately picking it up which is really neat the neat thing about it too is the rejection off of the backside so even though you are you know say in the scenario i'm thinking of an upright bass player i've got this mic'd up and, and the trap kit, the, the drums are right next to you because this was a jazz trio. The rejection was fantastic with that. So that's, that's a, just another scenario of, of where these guys are, are totally applicable outside of just your typical handheld use. 
so related to that, Paul, I had a question for you. Um, this capsule design, was it, was it a brand new design or was it essentially one of your studio mics um, kind of repurposed into a handheld mode? Tell me a little bit about the background because, you know, as I mentioned, it, it, a typical vocal mic doesn't necessarily flatter a violin in the way that the 2028 did in, you know, in that particular example. Right, good question. So this is an entirely new design capsule uh, that's sitting on this microphone. Uh, and we, we actually modeled it in some ways after one of our miniature, or what I would call our sub-miniature microphones, uh, the 6060, which is actually a three millimeter microphone. So the topography and how that, that capsule is designed in a stacked method is very similar to what's happening with the 2028. Here. So it's, it's a completely new design, but at the same time, we're maintaining all of the characteristics that you have come to know with, with DPA and, and how it is. It's just accurate. It's not going to give you anything that you don't necessarily want. So uh, before we wrap up today, uh, Lauren, I'm just wondering if maybe... Uh, there was one thing that stuck out in your mind now that you've uh, had a little bit of water under the bridge since uh, since you had to send the unit back, unfortunately. Uh, there's one thing that sticks out in your mind most of uh, about your time uh, using the 2028. I guess it would just be its versatility. Uh, it's, it's not often to find a microphone that will do um, so well in so many different applications. You may have a great handheld vocal mic and it's not useful for instrument applications. You may have a, a more flat and honest instrument style microphone, but you, you don't want to hold it in your hand because it makes a lot of noise. You don't want to put it close to your lips because it may not be have a flattering sound. So the 2028 excelled in so many ways. It's just, you know, it's, it's hard to fault. Like I said in my review, I usually find something to nitpick about almost everything that I review, but I, I couldn't come up with anything in, with this microphone. So again, a lot of that comes back to its versatility. I just, I think they nailed it. Well, Lauren, Paul, that's anything, a great compliment. Anything you'd like Thank to add? you. Oh, yeah. Anything like you'd like to add, Paul, no, before that's, we go for today? That's fantastic. I, I think Lauren summed it up fantastic there. Okay. Well, thank you both for, uh, for coming on today. And uh, uh, for Dave.video, Paul Andrews uh, with DPA Microphone and Lauren Aldrin, a writer, product reviewer, uh, musician, worship leader. So thank you guys both. Have a great day.